Um, good evening. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Jenna, and I'm really happy to welcome you to this evening's event, which is called At the Intersections. And this is the second last event in the Glen Ligon program. And um, I think many of you I've, I've seen in the discussions before, um, and, and some of you will, will know that what we're talking about tonight has been quite a familiar topic. Um, it's come up a number of times related to sort of the intersections between race, sexuality, and gender in the exhibition upstairs, but also in the absences from the exhibition upstairs, and particularly in some of the debates that we've been talking about, representations that come out of the civil rights movement, representations of Black Lives Matter in the contemporary context, which to some extent have um, not adequately dealt with the role of women of color and intersectional feminism in, in their representational histories. Um, this isn't a new problematic, but it's obviously one that is still deserving of quite a lot of discussion and, and indeed radical change. So um, this evening, it's with great pleasure that I introduce the And Beyond Institute for Future Research, which, um, with its focus on the otherworldly and future planning, sheds new and important light onto this discussion. The And Beyond Institute is a think tank that takes an intersectional feminist approach to space and positions space travel as women's work. We at Nottingham Contemporary learned of the Institute and its visionary founder, Sonia Dyer, through colleagues at Primary, which is a, a local cultural institution that you should all go to if you haven't already, um, where the Institute has resided for some months, developing a project with local women. This project will culminate in a cross-disciplinary two-day event in the autumn, and we thank our friends at Primary for bringing this important initiative to the city and um, Ms. Dyer for her creation of a truly inspiring organization. This evening, she and colleagues at the Institute have assembled a panel in which two key figures in the field of art, Shutaba Biswas and Ope Lore, will engage in an intergenerational discussion of the relationship between their work and the Institute's intersectional approach to women, space, the past, and the future. Shutaba is an artist and curator whose practice maps um, an intellectual landscape of feminism, diaspora, cultural identity, and I, I would emphasize this playfulness, onto powerfully visual images in, in installations and performances and critically written texts. Um, Shutaba's practice emerged in the 1980s when she was primarily a painter, and her paintings such as Housewives with Steak Knives, which hopefully we'll get a chance to see this evening, contributed significantly to debates on race and culture. Um, her works have appeared all over the world, and um, I've known Chitipa for a long time through also her work in, in Canada and, um, and other places, so it's great to have her here with us tonight. And Ope Lori is a conceptual and political artist who works primarily with moving image and photography around the politics of representation, race, gender, and sexual identity, and the female form in popular culture playfully rewriting these racialized scripts of looking and being seen, recognition and misrecognition. These take place through the use of homoerotic images of and between black women and white women in visual dialogues and increasing in her work um, between male images of men as well. And so it's really great to have Opie with us tonight. Um, I also wanted to say a few words about the Institute's um, illustrious founder, <laughs> Sonia Dyer, who has assembled this evening's event. Sonia is an artist artist, writer, and occasional curator from London. Her research-based practice often utilizes discursive platforms and the moving image. Her work is sometimes performative and often involves working with people. Um, she is concerned with the intersections of art and politics, modes of social organization, the utilization of public space, and performing research in public, which we'll experience this evening, no doubt. Her work explores how subjectivities and alliances are formed, particularly across cultures and disciplines. So this evening, we'll first hear from the Institute's founder, um, who will kind of set out the trajectory of, of the Institute itself. And then we'll hear from Shutapa and Ope, and then we'll have some time for people to ask questions. So thank you very much for being here this evening. Future Research is a peripatetic think tank involved in the creation of possible futures. Our aim? A future 
future space program led by an intergenerational, international team of women working towards the creation of a new home in the Andromeda Galaxy. The And Beyond Institute for Future Research works across disciplines, cultures, and temporal realms. Our network of partners are all actively involved in the creation of counter-hegemonic strategies for building a dynamic, progressive, and fantastic future. The human imagination is the most powerful tool we have at our disposal. It has put women in space, men on the moon, created jet engines, and prepared pizza to be eaten 400 kilometers away from Earth. We have built pyramids and the atom bomb, created mega cities and mega forests. But there is more, much more, beyond the stars. This is the most radical version of the future we can imagine. At the Institute, we believe that the future we can visualize is a future we can manifest. Can we imagine a space program led by women? What would it look like? If we can imagine it, we can conceive it. If we can conceive it, we can visualize it. If we can visualize it, we will build it. Get on board. Join us. For further information on the And Beyond Institute for Future Research, visit our website or send us an email. The And Beyond Institute for Future Research. We make the future. So the title of our presentation today is called Manifest Destiny, a loaded term, as I'm sure you're aware. As the information mentioned, the And Beyond Institute for Future Research is a peripatetic think tank, and we're involved with the creation of possible futures, working towards the creation of this intersectional feminist space program, heading towards the Andromeda galaxy. Now, we chose the think tank model as it allows space for a range of collaborative and solo projects. It allows for experimentation with ways of being and working, developing strategies for future decision making and social organization, and also as a means of conducting research and advocacy. The aim of a think tank in general is to influence human behavior, governmental and intergovernmental policies, and to produce intelligence. We're also keen to subvert the meaning of certain common terms, finding a new language to describe the future we wish to create, and proposing a new common language, as well as advocating counter-visual strategies to combat structural erasure of women, particularly, but not exclusively, of black women, within the public sphere. Part of this work involves uncovering the hidden visual histories of space travel as a strategy to fight this structural erasure from narratives of the future. We're also interested in developing an index of visual material that creates a counter-visual narrative or a counter-history of futurity, an index of how the future might be constructed and is being made. So we see space travel as the ultimate expression of the human engagement with the idea of the future, the most ambitious expression of our will. If we take the work of philosophers such as the Italian uh, Franco Berardi, otherwise known as Biffo, he posits the idea that, uh, in the Western world, certainly, that we've lost the, the ability to imagine the future, that it's been stolen from us by the force of neoliberalism. And in a sense, there is a, a, almost an exhaustion around the idea of the future that we're trying to kind of tease out and reinvigorate. Um, as Jenna mentioned earlier, we're working with Primary at the moment, and we're working towards a public event uh, in September. I thought it would be good to kind of quickly go through some terms that may come up in discussions of intersectionality and the way in which it's framed in terms of how uh, multiple subject positions can intersect. Um, the term is well, credited with being uh, invented or uh, certainly uh, popularized by the American academic Kimberly Crenshaw, but it also goes back to movements further back from that, so the Kahambi River Collective in the 70s, and also people like Sojourner Truth in the 19th century with her anti-woman speech, where she 
makes a, a declaration of the fact that she's both black and a woman, um, and that, that uh, necessitates thinking about her subject position in a particular way. So by definition, intersectionality is a, a study of intersections between forms or systems of oppression, domination or discrimination. It can also be described as a place where two or mo more roads cross. And today we want to take on both of these definitions of the term, a means of fighting repression and also as a potential source of visual and social pleasure. So this is an example of how one's subject position might be formed, some examples of the kind of intersectional interlacing um, of elements that might create a personality. And if we think about uh, the aim of an intersectional praxis, it is surely to destroy structural inequalities, um, to create a world where multiple subjectivities exist peacefully within a person. We could exist peacefully within ourselves and with each other. So in order to confront and challenge and dismantle what Bell Hooks calls uh, white supremacist patriarchy, the aim is to tackle misogyny, misogyny noir, which is a particular formulation that's coming out of a lot of young black uh, feminists in the States, of a particular form of misogyny that's directed towards women of African descent, often by men of African descent, as well as the wider world, um, homophobia, and the systemic erasure of women, particularly women who we might say are melanated. We would also declare that intersectionality is not just black women's work. That is, for all of us who wish to dismantle these systems of oppression. So today we want to test out some ideas and explore this idea of intersectionality in relation to encounters and collision and the work of the And Beyond Institute for Future Research and our engagement with visual culture more broadly. Uh, here we see um, Zoe Lennis, two women looking at each other which is uh, an amazing image, I think. Um, perhaps we can talk about that in the Q&A afterwards. I won't take up too much time with that. So one of the things we want to do is to, um, as I say, generate new terms. And one of the terms that we're playing with right now is this idea of apocalypse. You will notice in the middle of the word there is PLC, which is people of color. Um, I would say that Sonia Dyer, the individual, is quite ambivalent about people of colour as a term and finds it rather useless in terms of the context of Britain. But the Institute itself uh, can see its utility as potentially useful. And so this is one of the words that we're testing out to see if we can make it stick, see if we can get the rest of the world to start talking about apocalypse. Apocalypse is a way of thinking through a kind of visualisation of the future that is uh, more complicated and more multi-ethnic than that which we are currently have access to in common culture. And we get through that um, as we go through the, the uh, presentation. So what might a index of apocalypse look like? Um, one of the acts we're actually engaging in Nottingham is developing uh, a pantheon of foremothers of women who are involved with kind of creating the future with space travel, with generating fictive narratives of the future as well. And one of our colleagues here, uh, who's based in the think tank in Nottingham, is developing this through our Twitter profile. We also wish to create a visual register of the apocalypse in order to bring it about. So it's something that we see as simultaneously occurring and yet to occur. Uh, please allow me to share some images with you that seek to demonstrate this seemingly contradictory state. What they want to do today is to make the case for the possibilities of space travel as an intersectional activity. So I'm talking about space travel as both a material reality, a thing that exists in the world, and also as a metaphor for the practice of kind of messing about with the temporal realm. So here we have a, a Twitter message that features an image of the Indian Space Research Organization. Um, it's from the successful launch of their Mars Orbiter mission. Um, which is known as, uh, I'm going to try and pronounce this word correctly, Mangalalan in Sanskrit. Interesting thing to note about the Indian Space Agency, which is led by these women here, it's the fourth space agency to reach Mars, but it's the first space agency to reach Mars on its first attempt. So if you want to get the job done, this is who you call. <laughs> so in addition to Apocalypso, we want to try and introduce this wonderful world, Mangalalan, 
native society beyond India? How can we make this a common verb in the way that we might use the word hoover to describe the act of vacuum cleaning? How can we use this language to bring about this paradigmatic shift? As an institute, we want to use visual arts and popular culture as well as critical theory as tools for understanding the complex sets of negotiations and intersectional practice in the form of an art practice might require of us. So this includes the opportunity um, to create unexpected juxtapositions, to look into and beyond theory, and to introduce and be beyond two unexpected allies on multiple fronts. There is also this issue, this ongoing question of temporality and the complexity of our relationship with time, particularly those of us of the African diaspora. And this uh, Glenn Ligon piece, I don't know if you can read it, uh, but it's in the show upstairs as well. But it very much speaks to this kind of complex relationship with space and time. And I'm really interested in thinking about this particular work in relation to this image um, of Grace Jones, which is from this weekend. Um, she took part in a music festival. And what I'm intrigued by with this image is it's a mix of a kind of Erzast uh, Africana stroke, uh, Keith Haring, this kind of fusion of pseudo ancient and contemporary technology, which looks altogether futuristic. Uh, now, I recently saw the Mad Max film. I don't know if anybody has seen the new Mad Max. Interestingly, although it was shot in the African nation of Namibia, there weren't really any black people in it. Uh, and it strikes me that. Grace Jones would be perfect for this Mad Max, right? She doesn't even need to get out of this costume. So when thinking about our relationship with uh, these images and the need to kind of dismantle oppression, I want to share a few examples of, of uh, intersectional practices in pop culture, where I think most of this work, much of this work is being done. So I want to share this image of uh, Cindy Mayweather, which is also in the infomercial. Uh, Cindy is the alter ego of Janelle Monáe, who's an American musician. And I wanted to read a bit from a quote of hers. She says, I have a vivid imagination. Growing up, my grandmother watched Star Wars, Star Trek, and The Twilight Zone. And I've always had a love for science fiction. I watched Fritz Lang's German expressionist film, Metropolis, and I was so in that world that I actually dreamt about Cindy Mayweather. She's in the future, but I feel as though we share the same DNA. And she talks about creating cyborgs as the new other. So if you look on her head, um, this is a city that Monet has created called Metropolis. Also, some of us refer to it as Wonderland. And uh, some of her music videos take place within this city. Um, but I'm really intrigued by the visualization, by the costume, uh, and also by her kind of innocent, mystical expression. Janelle Monet often represents herself like this, in her uniform of black and white, um, tailored, menswear-inspired clothing. And as she explained, it's a dedication to uniformity. Um, she describes it as a, as a minimalist. But a lot of it has to do with me wanting to have a uniform, like the working class, like my mum and my grandmother. So again, it's her paying homage to her working class background, her family, and the dignity of her family in work. I'm interested in, in these kind of two modes of self-presentation because they often uh, can draw up um, complex or predictable, perhaps, responses from others, including one particular man who got in touch with her via Twitter to ask why she doesn't wear more dresses because she has a nice figure. And this was her response. So this idea of um, uniform and unisex being somehow uh, tricky uh, territory is something that I want to explore through this image of um, another American artist, Santa Go. This is an image from her Master of My Make Believe album. This image fascinates me. So it's, it operates on three temporal realms, but also both in three dimensions and two dimensions. At the back, we have a painting by the artist Kahinde Wiley, who some of you may be familiar with. Um, he often paints, um, well, he mainly paints um, people of African descent in the style and manner of well-known um, 19th, 18th century Western painting. So we have her in the background as a kind of semi-male, semi-female, who knows, uh, figure. 
We have on the other side these kind of twin sentinels who look like kind of cyborg sex bots from the future. And then in the middle, we have the name contemporary male drag. And I would argue not just male drag, but kind of white male drag. I mean, her hair is straight. She doesn't have an afro or fade or something. So this act of kind of challenging gender binaries as a, an assertion of self, as a form of play and experimentation, really brings to mind um, the work of Adrian Piper in the exhibition. This is a still from The Mythic Being. But as always, there is a potential for attention. And I wanted to play this two and a half minute uh, video of um, Nicki Minaj describing this. To be like a beast. You have to be a beast. That's the only way they respect you. I came up under Wayne, and Wayne has his way of doing things. When Wayne walks on the set and say, "Don't talk to me. Have my music ready. Get the up out of my face, and I'm gonna blow this your face all day." It's cool, but every time I every time I put my foot down and stand up for myself, it's like we've heard about Nicki Minaj. <laughs> Nicki Minaj shut down a photo shoot. Oh my God! Everyone's no one wants to work with Nicki Minaj. I'm glad you heard. Now, when I come to a photo shoot, let it be of quality. You know why? Because I put quality in what I do. I spend time and I spend energy and I spend effort and I spend everything I have, every fiber of my being to give people quality. So if I turn up to a photo shoot and you had and you got a fifty dollar clothes budget and some sliced pickles on the floor, you wanna know what? No, I am gonna leave. Is that wrong for Wanting more for myself, wanting people to treat me with respect. But you know what? Next time they know better. But had I accepted the pickle juice, I would be drinking pickle juice right now. When I am assertive, I'm a bitch. When a man is assertive, he's a boss. He bossed up. He bossed up. Yeah, he bossed up. No negative connotation behind bossed up but lots of negative connotation behind being a bitch. Donald Trump can say, you're fired. Mm -hmm. Let Martha Stewart run her company the same way and be the same way. Oh, evil But Donald Trump, he gets to hang out with young and have 50 different wives and just be cool. Oh, Donald, we love you. Donald Trump. But when you're a girl, you have to be like, everything you have to be you have to be dope at what you do but you have to be super sweet and you have to be sexy and you have to be this and you have to be that and you have to be nice and you have to it's like i can't be all those things at once i'm a human being i don't mean to be ranting and raving like this i don't don't use this footage please it's just gonna make me look stupid so to me, this is brilliant. This is doing a lot of intersectional work in an unexpected place, perhaps. Um, but, and also this kind of tension between, again, gender presentation and the value of self and the sense of self-agency, um, of presence and of bodily authority, of daring to be seen. And it's all done wearing this ridiculous pink wig, holding a pink mirror, doing your makeup. It's, to me, it, there's a lot to unpick in that, in, that, um, in that video. But I want to say this idea of being like bossed up of being in charge, of, being, of having authority, and return to this idea of, of space travel again. Um, but again, looking at this picture of um, Sunita Williams, um, this is taken from the India Times. So Sunita Williams is an American astronaut, the Indian American astronaut. Um, she spent um, six months aboard the ISS in 2006, she actually led the ISS at one point. Um, she has a record for spending longer in space than any other woman. So she, is, she was at one point the head human in space. And if we think about who gets to be bossed up, who gets to be uh, represented as being kind of authoritative in space, in uh, popular culture, we're looking at images like this from Interstellar. Interstellar is worth unpicking as well as a film. Interstellar presents this kind of near future America that is almost entirely white and a kind of future future America that is completely white. 
Um, and also films like Gravity and the forthcoming film The Martian, where Jessica Chastain um, is the commander, is the Sunita Williams of her time. But then if we turn to kind of self-initiated projects like this um, Kenyan science fiction film called Pumzi, we see as a countermeasure to this, this act of erasure of ignoring the Sunita Williams of the world is to kind of create your own images. And with that in mind, I want to end by telling a story, a narrative that I've presented in various forms um, over the last six months or so. Firstly, as uh, part of the um, Ambion Institute Future Research press conference at Primary earlier on this year, um, most recently on radio as part of a project called Critical Ways, which is coming to resonance uh, later this month, I think. Um, we're also working on an infomercial about this narrative. And I think the story gives us a chance to think about um, this assertion of power beyond thinking about mere representation or role modeling, beyond erasure as a kind of counterfactual narrative. So this is an image of Bessie Coleman, who was born in 1892. She was the first female pilot of African descent, the first African-American to hold an international pilot's license. Now, she had the international pilot's license because no flying school in the States would agree to train her because she was black. So during segregation. So um, various wealthy members of the black community funded for her to travel to Paris um, to train, and she returned to the States in triumph versus this kind of sensational civil aviator. Now, I'm sure many of us have heard of Amelia Earhart, um, but maybe not so many of us have heard of Bessie Coleman. I would argue, and the Institute would argue, that Bessie Coleman is an uh, inspiration behind Nata Uhura from Star Trek. Uh, in its own way, a kind of historical representation of a woman of African descent in American television, probably the first non menial role. Uh, interestingly, the actress, Nichelle Nichols, was never given a contract by the um, television company. They objected to her being uh, cast in the first place, so she was only ever employed as a day player on a day by day basis. But Nichelle Nichols has done remarkable work for the uh, advancement of space travel, including working for NASA. Um, this is a picture of, of her at NASA in 1977, um, where she was working to um, get a new crop of women and also people of um, Africa and other non-Western descent um, into uh, NASA and working in the space agency. And this is something that she did uh, on her own initiative. This is the quote from uh, Mae Jemison, who was credited as being the first woman of African descent in space. Um, she went aboard the Endeavour Space Shuttle in uh, 1992. And it just testifies to how the character of Uhura influenced her own decision as a very bright young child who's really into science to actually think that she could become an astronaut and to go for it. but we must remember Henrietta Lacks. Henrietta Lacks was born uh, in the early part of the 20th century. She died in 1951 of cervical cancer as a very young woman and a, a mother. Uh, I don't know if any of you have heard of the story of Henrietta Lacks, but she, um, her cells were taken from her body without her permission, without her family's knowledge, and turned into a multi-billion dollar industry. Um, the cells are called HeLa cells. They're used for lots of medical research because they're kind of self-replicated, even though they're supposedly defective. Um, and her cells were sent into space before any human being. They were sent as part of early probing space missions. So Mae Jemison is the first kind of fully whole black woman in space, but Henrietta Lacks' cells were also sent before anybody else. Interestingly, Mae Jemison, Dr. Jemison, is now the principal officer of the 100-year Starship project, which is working towards the creation of human interstellar travel within the next 100 years. So she's effectively um, creating the kind of future that Uhura existed within in the fictional world. One other interesting note about Jemison is that she, with her, on her space travel, she brought with her a picture of Bessie Coleman. So you see how it becomes kind of circular. I wanted to end by um, returning to Uhura and what Uhura did next. Hi, I'm Michelle Nichol. Years ago, I told you about NASA's new idea for a spaceship called the Space Shuttle. It was an exciting time.
time and we show what we can accomplish in low earth orbit. During the shuttle era, we built the International Space Station. Astronauts orbit the Earth conducting scientific research in space for the benefit of all humankind. And now, there's Orion. NASA's newest space vehicle, rocketed off the Earth by NASA's space launch system. The Orion spacecraft will be able to take us deeper into the solar system than we have ever gone before. So once again, we're about to begin a whole new era of exploration with endless possibilities where we can boldly go. Discover more about NASA's new path into the final frontier right here at this website. Orion, I'm on board. So I was tempted to play this without the sound, but I just love that last line and the way she delivers it, so I had to, um, I had to leave the sound on. So yeah, this idea of, um, of manifest destiny, of being bossed up, of thinking about kind of counter histories or space travel, of thinking about um, the way in which we construct the future is very much what we're involved with at the Institute. Um, when I think about the story of Mae Jemison, of Uhura, of, of uh, Bessie Coleman, of Sunita Williams, of the Indian space industry, I kind of think, well, the apocalypse is here, but the apocalypse also needs to be continually brought into being. And this is what we're working towards at the Institute, um, creating a conceptual and intellectual framework three visual arts, three propagandas, three various other manifestations, um, working towards a kind of counter visual attack on Eurasia, and also an utopian reclamation of the future imaginary. So, what kind of future can we create? And who gets to determine what the future looks like? What kind of destiny can we collectively manifest? Here are some contact information. Um, and also a link to the project at Primary as well. We'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now we do have time. Thanks. Um, thank you so much. Um, uh, I just want to say welcome and uh, also to primarily thank Sonia uh, for this wonderful invitation to enter into a dialogue and of course to uh, my uh, dear long-standing friend <laughs> Jana and, and uh, colleague I should say really because we've been working professionally in, in various contexts for a long time. Um, Thank you, Sonia, for that really uh, wonderful um, presentation, um, which, for me, stretches and contextualizes um, much of what I, when I say stretches, it sort of engages with and ex extends outwards from some of the themes that are very present within the context of my own practice. And I guess on the subject of uh, temporality, I remember one of the um, first words that, or first terms that I came into um, contact with through a kind of questioning mode really, was through my, my father who would always, you know, remind us of the sort of spatio-temporal nature of things, of time, of being, of discourse, of debate. And I think that for me that's been such an important aspect and component of, um, of the way in which I try to engage with different conceptual aspects of, of my work. 
My practice is described as being very conceptually grounded, and I would say that that is the case. And that really, um, for me, uh, I'm primarily very much engaged with in and around a discourse that deals with questions of of time, of space, of temporality, history. And seeing that, understanding that in the main through uh, a dialectic or a kind of uh, around um, gendered uh, sort of issues and concerns. So dealing with questions of, of, of feminism, if you like, in relation to how, for me, I begin to engage with the world and with history, um, both past and present and future. Um, I want, in that vein, to perhaps very briefly speak about the context of my own relationship to the context of art and art history. I had a very traditional um, training, if you like, in um, art and fine art and art history. Um, and indeed, being an undergraduate student at the University of Leeds, where at that time over 60% of the course, I would say, was very much uh, focused on a kind of art historical critique or analysis. And in the process of that, I guess that in a similar scale, well, it was a much larger scale uh, lecture theatre, the Rupert Beckett Lecture Theatre, but I began to fall in love with the uh, with art history and the kinds of images that I was being um, taught about as a student because I was bathed in the light of a huge projected image in space. And it's interesting to me because my own background was from, if you like, not only doing art as an A-level subject, but also with the idea that, because I studied the sciences alongside art, and I think that for me, the idea of traveling across between and beyond history really came from that sense of thinking about temporality and how to move beyond any moment in time into a, a temporal sort of space or a possible space. And in that sense, I remembered from when I began to study art history, one of the first images that I encountered as a young child growing up in, in England was this painting by Jan Vermeer, Woman in Blue Reading a Letter. And the reason it really struck me um, as a young child, and then again when I was reintroduced to it as an undergraduate student, was because having... I should have mentioned I was born in India and came to England when I was about four years of age. But when we arrived in England, um, I used to watch my mother often um, reading her letters, stood in front of the window in our home. And strangely enough, on some occasions, I re recall very vividly that she was wearing a blue sari. And the colour has the same sort of inflection and shimmer, if you like, to the colouring and the palette within this painting by Vermeer. And for a long time, that really intrigued me. You know, why was it that suddenly when I, you know, look at this painting by Vermeer, that I'm transported to that point in, in time within my own personal sort of life history, if you like? And I began to realize as I was studying art history that the context of Vermeer's painting was really quite critical for me because of the map that lies in the, in the background. And of course, this, this painting was made by um, Vermeer around the same time that um, the Dutch East India Company was being established, if you like. So there were all of these very subtle and quiet nuances that, for me, were beginning to make sense, I believe, from a very early age in my life. Um, I'm just going to hope that I'm pressing the right thing, actually. No, I'm not. <laughs> I think I need help. Oh, no, okay, great, thank you. Um, 
Um, and I want to move very briefly to, to, to this particular um, image of, which was taken at, uh, um, it's the interior space of the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford. And um, I was invited some years ago, I believe it was around 1992 or so, to create a work that uh, was site specific to this piece. And I think wonderfully, I didn't have very much money at the time at all. I think I had about 60 pounds. And so I, uh, which as a budget was, was really, you know, very, very small. But I tried my best to think about how to engage with the space. And if you don't know the Pitt Rivers Museum, it was, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting sort of ethnographic museum of a collection, I think, amassing to over 20,000 articles, uh, artifacts, objects from all around the globe. And what's interesting about it is that unlike many sort of ethnographic exhibitions that are, if you like, curated such that they're organized by way of, you know, this comes from India, this comes from Wales, this comes from Niger, this comes from China, blah, blah, blah. It's just done according to spoons. So you will have spoons from all around the globe. And so, it, it, but what was interesting to me was how these artifacts came to be in this particular place. So again, my interest in, in history, and, and in particular colonial history and how objects and subjects are contextualized and brought to, uh, you know, to, to be framed within these kinds of spaces. So I created a work that was um, a slide projection piece. And for a very long time, I've been working with language and taxonomies. And in particular, I've been interested in the kinds of taxonomies that emerged out of the sort of high Victorian era and working with sort of Victorian sort of sayings and phrases and rhymes, etc. So um, with very little money, um, but ambition, with ambition, I created a work that was sort of based on that old say, you know, the sort of uh, piece of prose, uh, Tinker Tailor, Soldier, Sailor, Rich Man, Poor Man, Beggar Man, Thief. And so what I did was to create a slide projection work using just that text, Tinker, Tailor, Soldier, Sailor, Rich Man, Poor Man, Beggar Man. But the word thief was missing, and it went on to repeat. Tinker, tailor, soldier, sailor. And it was projected onto the sail that you see here. So for the audience in experiencing this work, which for me sometimes working with spaces in a very quiet way is really very important to me because I like, as much as I love working with sound, actually I like the exact opposite. The sense that you experience sound through silence actually. Um, so in, in, in seeing and reading the text, of course, you, one became very aware in identifying the fact that the word thief was missing. In other words, it was implicated within the context of the space. Um, I hope you can, uh, I think you can read that writing. So um, I'm going to try to move a little bit fast. Um, I guess that for me, as I've mentioned, my work sort of traverses the past, the present, and the future, thinking about what's possible. And in as much as thinking about the past, I've come to constantly be brought back to, to considering how much has effectively changed. And this particular image, although I don't know exactly the, um, the date of it, you can see from you know, the, the, the nature of the fashion, the, the style, the pith helmet, and the formal wear that the, um, that the, that the white woman is wearing, and also the, the, the servant here, that it's, it's probably um, sort of pre-independence, time of pre-independence, India, you know, possibly 30s, 40s, something like this. And so my point being really here is that, you know, even at that point in history going from the Mears painting, you know, and thinking about the space and the scope of the map in the background, not really very much had changed. 
as an undergraduate student, and here you go, this is Housewives with Steak Knives. Um, um, as an undergraduate student um, at Leeds University between 1981 and 1985, um, I've got so little time to talk about this work because I can get so absorbed into the context of what it means on a formal level. And uh, Housewives with, with Steak Knives, at the time that it was made, the iconography, which is based on the traditional four-armed Hindu mythological uh, figure of the uh, goddess Kali, who is known traditionally as, the, as representing the goddess of, of war. Um, but she also has a yin and yang to her. So she's not only a warrior goddess, but she's also the goddess of peace. And I think that that sort of duality is something that's also very interesting to me. Um, but at the time that I made this piece of work, um, the iconography, you know, images from outside of, uh, of a Western sort of trajectory, um, certainly within an, an art historical context, were, 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 were really pretty much uh, unseen. And I think in that sense, it sounds a bit braggy to say that you begin, that the work that you've made begins to shift some of that relationship. But when this work was actually shown and exhibited in 1985 at the ICA, um, it really did create quite a lot of storm, if you like. Uh, 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 it had quite an impact, um, and so much so that, I mean, it was shown as part of an exhibition called Thin Black Lies, which was the first major uh, exhibition curated by Lubaina Himid, the artist uh, Lubaina Himid, that brought together the work of, um, uh, I believe it was 10 uh, uh, black women artists of African and Asia, uh, Afro-Caribbean and Asian descent. And this particular work was spat upon whilst it was on exhibition at the ICA. And whoever spat on it was a great shock because there's one mark, guess where, right between the eyes. Um, and I think that what's interesting about the work and what's important for me was that this work was really born about uh, out of my desire to engage with formalism, with formal aesthetic uh, considerations. So, for example, the background very much is a reference to Rauschenberg's series of, of white paintings and how, at the time that that particular series of works was um, uh, exhibited, first exhibited, this was actually critiqued in spatiotemporal terms. Uh, which is very interesting. So in other words, a lot of the uh, reviews talked about the temporality of surface in terms of how the audience would engage with and experience that particular work by, series of works by Rauschenberg, which for me has become such a critical facet within the context of my own thinking about production and how I bring together images. Because for me, I mean, Rauschenberg's work, painting, series of paintings, literally it's house paint on canvas. But it's read in terms of what time of day you see it and how much light is being shed upon it and what exists in the shadows and surface of that work at any particular point in, day, uh, in the day. And um, for me, in this work, Housewives with State Knives, what was visible for me at any point in the day was the presence of blackness, was the presence of the woman, was the presence of a particular kind of woman. Um, so it just gives you um, a sense of scale. I'm really sorry, I'm going to have to sort of try and be quick. So as an artist, for me, working with formal concerns and aesthetics has been really as critical as the kind of context and content uh, of of the work in 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 terms of perhaps how I hope things might be be read in in or interpret yeah be read. So in um, 1994, I'd been invited by Locus Plus and an art gallery in Canada 
to create a work. As you can see, it's called To Kill Two Birds With One Stone. And it was in response to, um, well, it, it, I don't really think it was in response. That's a, uh, that's a wrong use of, of uh, wording, I think. It was made after I um, encountered a very strange experience the first time I traveled to Canada, which in 1990, it was during a time when I'd won a, a scholarship to study, to, to be at the Banff Center for the Arts in Canada. But on, on route, I stopped in Montreal. And it was right in the middle of um, a particular moment in Canadian history in Montreal when the government of, uh, of, um, uh, of, uh, of Ontario, um, Montreal, which were proposing to uh, to develop on sacred burial grounds of the First Nation indigenous peoples of that particular area. And of course this was very offensive to the indigenous peoples, uh, First Nations people. And in order to show their uh, protest, they decided to block the main arterial routes into Montreal. Um, but thereby affecting industry and, you know, the sort of working patterns of people. And what began to happen was a, um, a very uh, dreadful um, scenario where um, the extreme sort of francophones, I like to call them fascists, uh, really became very aggressive. And at one point, this involved the indigenous people who were protesting being stoned, literally. And there is a very interesting postcard of this particular moment in, in history. Um, and nothing was done, you know, until actually from the groundswell, there was a lot of anger. And then the government began to deal with it. And then the, the Montreal um, government, you know, local government began to deal with, with the issues in, in hand. But I arrived in Canada right in the middle of this event and very jet lagged. I thought, I'm really hungry. I need to, I need to go and eat something. I, I went out and um, found myself in this very ordinary looking place, I thought, except for the fact that it looked as if it was right out of an Edward Hopper painting, the one with the bar stools, the red bar stools, sat down, just ordered some soup. And in the process of doing that, um, I was confronted by a group of individuals, and in particular one man, who's, who got up from his chair, walked very aggressively back and forth, back and forth, swearing under his breath, and saying, uh, forgive me, I'm about to swear, I repeat, you know, it's those fucking squaws who are to blame. They're the ones that we need to get. And it, he obviously thought that I was an indigenous first per a nation person. And then proceeded, he proceeded to make phone calls. And I just thought to myself, I need to get the hell out of here. Um, and out of that particular moment in, in history, and I suppose that this for me is really important in terms of how I approach practice, in other words, trying to find a relationship between a very particular moment in history and time, and then thinking about how that relates to the context of um, a f the formal qualities that or, um, out of which that experience is, is born um, in terms of the work that, that's made. Um, so when I was invited to Winnipeg to make this work, I was very much thinking about how, you know, apart from the First Nations, Indigenous people of, of Canada, everybody was a foreigner, you know. And um, in particular, at the time that I made this piece, I was very interested in thinking about diaspora and how Asian people in particular, am I getting to my point? Yeah, okay, I'll try and hurry. Um, uh, how Asian, the Asian communities, diasporic communities ended up in Canada. And so I created a work, this piece, whereby I invited people to loan saris, if you like, um, around which I developed a text work. So one letter of the alphabet 
for each sari and one sari for each letter of the alphabet around which I built a narrative, if you like, of the story of the person who loaned me that sari. Um, and it was interesting because, I'll tell you this because it's kind of funny really, um, <laughs> for about six months before I was there, I was in communication, maybe even longer, I was in communication with the uh, director and the people at the gallery. And I said, well, you know, could you please see who might be willing to loan it, me something and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, um, when I, the few days before I left, left England to go to Canada, to, to Winnipeg, which was in the middle of winter, I have to tell you, so minus 40 degrees, you know, temperatures that, uh, there, thereabouts, um, they called me and said, Shutapa, I'm really sorry but um, to tell you, but we've got no loans. Nobody will lend us any sorries. And so I thought, oh dear, and I said, don't worry, I'll bring back up. So I talked to my relatives and my friends and, you know, family, extended family, and, you know, took back up. But then when I arrived, I was introduced to the young man who had been phoning around asking for um, loans, if you like. And um, he was a very sweet young man. Um, but he had a very thick German accent. So I just kind of thought this was interesting in terms of how they hadn't thought about that relationship between who's, who is asking for these saris. So of course people would hear this you know, strange man at the end of the phone, think it was a panty sniffer and put the phone down. So when I arrived in Winnipeg, I took the list and would meet with the people who loan these saris. And what was interesting for me was the fact that nobody would lend me a sari until, and understandably, they said, well, we'd really like the idea of this project. They weren't your general or average gallery-going audience, um, but you'll need to come and share a meal with us. So for 10 days, I put on a huge amount of weight, went literally in a taxi from one home to another. And out of that, this work was born. I don't have time to really talk about it in great depth, but what was interesting was the sari that you see um, just here. This one here, and this one here, um, was loaned to me by um, an Asian Caribbean woman. And I have to say that, t tell you that we had loans from, from gay men, from white women, from uh, Afro-Caribbean Canadian women, from all over the, the globe. Um, but this particular woman was very interesting because she said that she wants, she, when I came to return it to her, she said she wanted me to keep it because she had been really moved by the context of the performance work. It was just, I was absent, but it, I used the conversation to create the work that was based around these conversations and the alphabet. Um, and she said that these saris were the last gift that her mother had given to her as a, a young adult, and that she'd had a really difficult relationship with her mother, and, I, and went on to explain that she had come from, she'd been born in the Caribbean, and that her mother was an Indian woman who'd been um, sold into sexual slavery, been abducted from India and taken to the Caribbean. And for me, this was really important in thinking about diaspora and thinking about how those conversations come, come in and out of play. I don't have any time left, so I'm going to just very quickly flick through some of these images because, um, well, I don't have time to talk about them, unfortunately. But for me, again, you know, just to, to really perhaps sum, sum up um, with the idea of trying to find tropes, working with tropes that are considerations and often working with people whose lives I bring into my practice. So if it's family or extended family, so that somehow that becomes part of an extended sort of, uh, that becomes part of the taxonomy, I think, of, of my language. Okay, I'll just perhaps end on there. This is a work that I've been uh, doing through um, the tape very recently. Well, 
it's still in, in development, but yeah, maybe to end on that. Okay, thank you very much. Testing, testing. For tonight's edition of The X Factor, I'll be singing. <laughs> so good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. And uh, thank you uh, to Sonia for having me here today to speak on this um, very interesting show, um, Glenn and I go on, and to discuss questions around intersectionality and the black female body. Uh, so I've always been interested in Glenn Nygon's work, particularly in his image-making practice and obviously how he uh, creates meanings with deconstructing uh, images and just even thinking about the nature of the show. This particular uh, quote by Kabina Mercer really resonated with me because at the end of the day what we're seeing is one man's vision and basically Glenn Nygon is obviously, as a curator and the artist, he's in that position of power to talk about these questions around race, sex and gender. So for me, I should really use this clicker. Questions of belonging and identity and trying to understand myself as a black lesbian woman growing up in white suburban Essex has always been an issue for me. And there was two important moments in my life that made me really understand what gender meant, what sexuality meant, what race meant. The first of them was watching Disney Snow White the 1937 version, and I remember watching this when I was about five to seven years old. You can see me there on the right. So if you just imagine this picture, this young little black girl, after watching Snow White, runs up to the bathroom, takes some talcum powder out, puts it all over her face, and then runs back downstairs to her two other sisters. And you know, I was just so happy. I was like, oh my God, I really look like this Snow White, because I was just completely in awe of this cartoon. So now I come from a very strict Nigerian family. So after showing my sisters, I now ran up to my dad. My dad's a very strict Nigerian man. And I was like, Daddy, look at me. So basically, my dad beat me. <laughs> but that beating was very symbolic because it made me understand the importance of race, the fact that I was actually negating my blackness. And it also made me understand these notions of beauty and that really, as this black little girl, I was outside of those notions. So an image by Carrie Mae Weems really resonates with me. And as you can see the little caption, it says, looking into the mirror, the black woman asked, mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the finest of them all? The mirror says, I hope there's no American people in here, Snow White, you black bitch, and don't you forget it. So that was the first kind of moment. And so I thought it was really interesting that they put this work by Zoe Leonard in the Glenn Ligon show because in this way she's kind of reframing the black body into these spaces of beauty and these notions of femininity. There's two things I actually want to kind of quickly draw on in this image. Um, when it says the one woman looking at another, for me, I was actually also thinking about these issues of colorism. Uh, colorism is described as a privileging of lighter skin over darker skin predominantly within uh, non-white communities. And so for me, I would actually rewrite that text as one dark-skinned woman looking at a lighter-skinned other. And I think this is also symbolic from, if you look to the right, with the view from below, and it's kind of like ambiguous kind of colouring of the tights. So it's neither white, it's neither dark, it's in that kind of space in between. So I thought this is quite interesting. And this whole notion of colourism and this privilege of light skin, you know, was very much, this is kind of like my earlier work. Um, and this particular piece, it used six other black women of different complexions to talk about how these... Uh, kind of shades were associated with femininity. So the lighter you are, the more it was equated to being beautiful um, and accepting notions of femininity. The second um, experience of my life, which is, let's see, okay, it works. Yeah, so the second moment of my life that made me understand about race and gender was being in an interracial relationship with my ex-ex-ex-ex partner that you can see here. And this was done actually in 2009. 
Um, and for me, it was actually quite a very intimate piece. But I also wanted to talk about the ways that from the outside looking in, a lot of people used to see our relationship as one of dominance and passivity. They used to equate her as the feminine, beautiful other, and me as this very masculine, dominant partner. And they thought that this is how we played out all of the roles within our life when it wasn't really the case. Forget about how I'm dressed today. It just wasn't the case. So, and this was also done in 2009, where there's a lot of discussion around the demonization of black male youth and gun crime. And I really wanted to try and talk about these kinds of stereotypes. So obviously you can see the use of the gun and the use of the hoodie as well. So, I won't play that too long. So there's a lot of, you know, uh, there's a lot of things in the in popular culture and from articles that, this, that kind of reinforce these stereotypes. So I don't know if anyone remembers this article. It was in 2011, but I remember it like it was yesterday. And in it, can you imagine waking up, going to work on a packed tube? And the first thing that I open is this caption. It says, psychologists, black women are less pretty. So this was actually a null study. And basically, this Dr. Kanazawa said that black women were less uh, pretty because they had more testosterone in their bodies. Completely ridiculous. So you have these sorts of articles that reinforce this particular way of seeing gender and race. And also I was very interested in um, interracial lesbian dynamics in film and dramas. So for example, if anyone's seen The L Word, most of the black women here played the male, the male dominant other. And that was from 2004 to 2009. You had She Must Be Seeing Things. Again, it was the same kind of stereotype. The, I think she was a Latin black lady who was obsessed with her Marilyn Monroe looking partner. I think she was quite jealous. Again, she was a high, high um, powered lawyer. You can see Lip Service, which they did in 2010, which is a really tragic British lesbian drama. Um, again, the presence of an interracial couple, the mixed race lady was a mechanic. You see the women, which is another atrocious comedy, and we have our beautiful Jada Pinkert, who played the stud. And then we had Desert Hearts. Now, I threw Desert Hearts in here, one, because it was the first lesbian film which I watched. It was sport, actually, because my brother watched it too. And at that time, I think I was like, what, 11? And he was just like, he had a fetish for lesbianism until he realized I was a lesbian and that stopped. <laughs> so the reason I put that one in there, because even when you have same-sex couples, you still have to have that element of difference. And that element of difference became of the, came of the hair. So you have Faye, or I think Kay, who's on the left, and she was running after this very suburban, blonde-headed woman trying to convert her. So Desert Hearts is a very interesting movie to watch. And I think within the show, I think, again, it's also talk, you can see there's these associations with maleness, the male body, um, um, and masculinity, and blackness. So we have Glenn Ligon's When Black Wasn't Beautiful. We also have Steve McQueen's Bear. And this is also playing with gender stereotypes as well. Um, and I think this is why the inclusion of um, Agnes Varda's Blank Panthers was important, because even for me as I went round, I thought there was something slightly missing in terms of the presence of the black female body. So I think it was really interesting to have this in there, and also Zoe Leonard's works as well. So my work really is about deconstructing images, and just to point out, I only work really with representations. But however, we know that these representations have implications for the real. Hence why it talks about the effects of watching Disney's um, Snow White. And from this particular image, I kind of broke, broke it down into three major components. So some codes and conventions which I've carried on using in my practice. And these codes and conventions can be used sometimes altogether, which would, also, which would give some very complementary or sometimes contradictory meanings. And I think these sorts of things are very evident or implicit within practices which engage with intersectionality. And they can give kind of very ambiguous readings. So for example, just looking at that image, the first code is the code of color. So we have, on the left, black mama, white mama. 
So just think about how skin color in itself, as we know, is loaded and is symbolic. And not just think about skin color, but also think about the aesthetics of the image. So looking at Mal Glenn Nygon's Malcolm X, the fact that we had these little kids who were painting in the image, and now that that image is seen now as a queer version of Malcolm. So color in itself is heavily loaded. So that's one of my first codes. The second one is the code of junk's position. So thinking about how bodies placed either side by side or from front to back can create positions of power. So I thought this was quite interesting with the Robert Mapplethorpe, thinking about who is actually in power here in the image. Is it the white man in the way that he's positioned? Or if you go to the right, is it the black, is it the black male body? So that's junk's position. The third one is non-conventional communication, so thinking about dress, thinking about body posture, thinking about the use of props. And here we have um, a work by Helmut Newton, and Helmut Newton is someone that I've used quite a lot, or referred to quite a lot in my practice, because for me, and I'm sure some feminists may, may disagree with my use of his work, um, but I like the way that he tried to break down these kind of gender binaries so that women could be powerful, women could be seen as something else. And there we have Adrian Piper's um, The Mythic Being. So my work was really about creating these oppositional gazes and trying to o overturn these ways of seeing black and white women, making black women command the law of the gaze, be seen as spectacle. And I was trying to change these kind of hierarchies of power around, or what I thought was hierarchies of power around through domination. So here we have, again, Luden Beryl, the black woman looks quite magnanimous, standing on top of the white female stud. And that was like the first kind of part of my, my practice. However, in this kind of making and doing, I realized that there was something troubling me. The fact that I was reversing these pole polarities, was it really making black women more powerful? The fact that I was subjugating now white women to be seen in this lesser role didn't really sit well. So when you hear things by feminists such as Peggy Feeling that says visibility doesn't necessarily equate to power, really resonated with me. And this is when I kind of stopped my practice, which was just about trying to show these oppositional gazes. And this is where I am at the moment in terms of trying to just kind of go away from these normative ways of looking at race and gender. Um, trying to destabilize these very active, passive roles. And the next kinds of body of works, which I'm going to show you, are to do with playing with all of these kinds of binaries and destabilizing as many binaries as you can think of. So this particular piece was in a show in 2013, and it was called I Want Me Some Brown Sugar. It's actually an eight-screen installation, and it's eight characters four black people, four white people, and it's a similar kind of setup. So with all the characters, you have one person sitting down, and then you have the same people walking through the image. And this is actually a piece to do with pornography in the ways that, one, it uses all these sexist racial stereotypes to sell itself, so it would be like big black cock, cock, click onto this. But the second hand, you had all of these users, these users that hide behind the image, so if you ever, if anyone watch, looks at porn, I'm sure a lot of people look at porn. So the user comments I found very interesting. I really wanted to do an image and text piece and to expose this kind of racist way that people are talking about these particular categories. Um, as you can see, the uh, people are dressed, some people are not dressed. And if you can see the text as well, the only words which are kind of in capitals are black and white. And the only time you get text is when you have a difference of racial, di when you have different characters of racial difference walking past each other. So this piece actually created quite a lot of controversy, um, like through the artist talks and the events. And just to note, there's one particular time where we had a talk, and there's a room full of lesbians and women, and there was one black guy, and the one black guy somehow had the he was brave enough to say, I find this work really pleasurable. And as soon as he said that, he was shut down, 
by a handful of women who said, you can't find a lesbian works like this pleasurable. How dare you say that? Now, for me, he never said what he found pleasurable in the work. But after having a later discussion, he said he found experience pleasurable. He, he, there was something about desire, and in that space of desire, there is no kind of limitation. There's no, that desire in itself broke down these particular binaries. And that's what my work really is about. It's about desire, it's about pleasure, and trying to break it down. So this is just the last piece of work which I'll show you. And again, it's just a snippet of like 10 minutes of a two-screen video projection called Alpha and Beta. And again, it's a culmination of everything I've discussed in terms of the codes and conventions, the positions of power, the binary positions, and really trying to break down all of these constructed ways of seeing and being. And I'll leave it just for another 30 seconds. If you have any questions about that particular piece, then you can ask us at the, at the very end. Thank you. I do find your comment about Snow White quite interesting. Mm -hmm. um, just from an experience that I had when I was um, at primary school mm -hmm. in a convent school. Yes. And, uh, no, it's just interesting because I was Snow White, mm. but I was the only mixed-race child apart from my two sisters in the school and my brother. Mm. But they chose me to be Snow White. And like you, I did exactly the same thing and went home and got loads of white powder. Mm. Um, but I was encouraged because my mum had separated. And we actually referred to my, my father as mm. Harpick. Or I didn't, but they did clean round the bend. Hmm. But it was a complete disassociation from who I was. Mm -hmm. So your Snow White thing was quite interesting. Thank you. Well, it stayed with me till it now. It stayed with me. It's a very when powerful you did the... image. It is, yes, it is. My middle sister has blue eyes and white skin. Right. I'm... So even like the idea of like colorism is quite interesting as well yeah in terms of this we're both talking about this but again we still have this difference of skin color so absolutely and all three of us are different colors right so, so it's quite interesting hmm. there's a lady just over there i am particularly sorry no please do go ahead reaching is no, okay. Fine. Okay. Um, I'm really interested because <laughs> my mum used to wipe me up in Singapore, so I look white. So I've got a poem about pancake makeup, which I think was published by Linton Quasi Johnson. Because um, when I was doing poetry in London, I moved up here from College Arts. Um, I'm particularly interested in, in all the panelists' discussion. I, I found the whole thing amazing. Um, you know, everything from science fiction through to to duality and investigating that, and uh, and you've all it, certainly in, in my work, own work, been major references I've used. So that's quite interesting. Uh, so it's good to be here to be here tonight. But uh, very shortly, I was uh, I'm interested in this thing about about role reversal. 
and about whether one just exchanges one sort of oppression for another. So this is the thing that's kind of bugging me a bit. Um, I mean, for example, the thing about I'm a bitch if I stand up for myself and all the men are just good, tough guys, you know, and, and you expect that of them. Would it be any better if it was actually reversed? <laughs> what kind of hell or heaven would that be? You know, do you see what I'm getting at? Um, I mean, how does one, you know, what the conclusion? Uh, do you want, does one get any pointers out of one's art to that? That's all. Um, and I'm just basically looking at this idea of duality. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I might just jump in really quickly. I mean, I think that's why I find that particular film and that particular clip interesting because I have no interest in Nicki Minaj as an artist, right? I don't, I think her lyrics are garbage. But what I'm interested in is the work that she does as a personality in talking about quite complex, within the work world of academia, there are quite complex theoretical concepts of intersectionality um, and, of, and the way in which she talks about um, her experience of being a woman in the world in which she operates. And I'm interested in the fact that it's been done quite publicly and that it's been done part of, as a part of pop culture. Um, but I do, uh, you know, in terms of this idea of is re reversing the roles enough, I mean, I would argue personally that no, it isn't. But I also think that for many people from many kind of subject positions, I keep using this Marxist term to find it quite useful, I think it's a, a, an interesting place to start and sometimes a necessary start to unpacking some of these complexities of how to live and how to be. Um, sometimes just being able to assert yourself is the start of a much kind of longer journey. Um, and so that is my response to that clip in particular. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things I, I mentioned a lot in regards to the Institute is that we want to go beyond role models. So even when I tell the story of these astronauts and travelers, I'm aware that I, I am in a way setting them up as, as role models even though I kind of decry the act of role modelling. Um, so there is this kind of constant kind of dialectic between um, myself uh, uh, as someone who uh, admires what these people have achieved, but also as a kind of artist and theoretician who wants to look at the way in which the representations can shift paradigms. Can I add something mm, to that? Please. I, I think um, uh, your question is a really important one, and I would agree with you. I mean, that we didn't have time in this context to talk about those things, but the work, for example, with the horse in it, actually, it's my son who is in that work. And so for me, it was actually very, you know, his, it sort of arrived out of um, a conversation. The first sentence he ever said to me, which was, Mum, I'd like a horse to live with us in, and I, you know, he was 18 months. And it was the first sentence, proper sentence he spoke. And um, I said, well, where would you like it to live? And he said, right here with us in the living room. And it just opened up a whole series of questions for me that took me back actually to the Stubbs painting um, uh, that I sort of flashed up. And I think that in the making of that piece, actually, I... It was precise, and there are other pieces I, I've developed and had worked, um, uh, produced in working with him, was, was precisely to look at that relationship between me as a woman and as a mother, you know, thinking about this young child who has this sense of aspiration, if you like, this, where he sees no, no division between fantasy and, and reality for him. That's his world, that is his reality. And I think that, you know, that for me, those, those kinds of binaries are really interesting and important. And just also to mention, there are other pieces that, even in terms of Tinker Tailor, Soldier Sailor, you know, that, that I think begins to unpick some of those problematics, if you like. But there is another piece called The Trials and Tribulations of, of Mickey Baker, you know, who it's a work that's in the Tate collection and it's a, an image of a, um, a portly middle-aged man completely naked stood in front of a window and his remit is to stand still and of course he can't it's a white man and um, and I think that you know for, for me being the director if you like the person behind the camera it was very interesting in terms of how the aesthetics of that piece functions because He's really as vulnerable as the white woman in Hopper's paintings 
stood in front of the window. So I think that for me, often what I'm interested in as an artist, and I think that's the case in, in all of the work that we've talked about, and one of the works downstairs in the exhibition, I think probably it's a Glenn Ligon piece where he talks about the edges falling away, you know, crumbling. I think it's the work that is called, that has the piece saying, I am a man, which of course comes from that very, very famous uh, saying, uh, uh, speech rather. So I think that there's, I don't think it's, 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 not, it's not hermetically sealed, you know, it is something that's very much um, in a state of flux. And I, I believe that the whole concept of temporality and spatial, the spatial temporal is precisely something that underpins that very thing. Mm. I mean, just to add as well, just to what Sonia said, in terms of this role reversal, as you saw with my practice, I had to leave it because really that was already very limited in a way. And so even if you think about the question, it's like when people say the oppositional gaze, what does that mean? In opposition to what? And that gaze in itself is, a very, is already very limited. So I think what Sonia's proposing this think tank is a way for us to look beyond all of these things and, you know, kind of leave it by the wayside in a way. But the question of what that looks like is another thing. But I think, you know, doing the role reversals, I think they're part and parcel of ways of seeing, but they don't really necessarily, they're not really the finished answer. Mm. Can we go to the woman in the hat? She's had her hand up for a while. <laughs> Um, I find this talk very inspiring personally because um, you're creating conversations about power, which I think is one of the biggest forms um, that mm. man has ever created, the idea of power and mm. how we distribute power. So yeah, all, all of you talk about um, power roles and how um, we see uh, people. And this is, I see it every day, like in my community, um, that it's kind of this... Uh, this presence, I think presence is important because when you walk in a room, you you acknowledge blackness, you acknowledge you acknowledge these things. It's physical attributes, and I feel that you know I want to know um, kind of your concepts and ideas behind um, kind of what we see in England today. Like, and if you go like I find um, for me, creating artwork is about looking around you, like your environment, even this room, you know, what am I learning from what I'm seeing in this room, how people are communicating, how people, it, in, basically interracial relations between people. And I think um, one question is how you come up with these concepts, how you formulate your ideas and concepts for your pieces, um, that basically the process of research, because um, I think that was talked about before, how you come about researching these things. So I think methodology is very important in terms mm. of concept and these things that you're talking about. And um, uh, also your idea um, on racial fetishism and how um, probably pointed uh, towards how we see race today. So that's quite a lot. Sorry. That was Sorry. like loads of questions. <laughs> Everyone's okay. 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 All right. Um, you, you kind of asked the question about you know, what we think about England now. Is it, was that part of the question? Because right, England bores me. So I'm really, I'm bored in this country. And that's my main relationship with England right now. Um, but in terms of the process of research and how I get these ideas, I think, okay, so up until about 2012, I spent four or five years working on a project that was using the legacy of Paul Robeson to consider notions of community and looking at this kind of early 20th century idealistic international socialism. I don't know if anyone's heard of Paul Robeson. Mm -hmm. Um, if you haven't, I'd really recommend you looking up, especially younger people in the audience. It's really worth checking out. There was an, an African-American man who was the son of uh, someone who was enslaved. He was in no particular order, an uh, academic, a lawyer, um, an actor, singer, uh, communist, allegedly, civil rights activist. He spoke around 27 languages. Um, he was probably only the second black person to play Othello. He was an amazing person. He was kind of destroyed by various secret American um, 
activities because he was an outspoken black internationalist who was associated with communism during the 1950s. Anyway, look him up. So I spent years working on Robeson. I had a show at um, the Sight Gallery in Sheffield. And I spent basically five years exploring the legacy of this great man. And I just thought, I had enough of making work about great men, actually. Um, but firstly, I had enough of thinking about great men, but also thinking about the past. And I've always been interested in science fiction. Um, I read a lot of science fiction and watch a lot of science fiction. And I, I went to live in the States for a year and a half, and I came back and decided to focus my activities around kind of collective female energies and also to look to the future because that was kind of a natural place for me to go. I've also in the past been involved with a lot of um, writing and kind of advocacy um, work that involved working with think tanks and I thought rather than give my intellectual labour to um, another entity I would actually create my own think tank and then choose who I work with and who I invite and so on. Um, so it's a natural progression of just kind of being a nerd and liking these things, but also really wanting to, really feeling bored in this country and wanting to kind of go somewhere else. That's what the imagination allows us to do, I guess. Can I just also pick up on that question about history and where we, we see ourselves? I mean, for me, I, I am interested in, in historical moments whatever they might be. I, I was particularly, I mean, there's so many works downstairs that in uh, Glenn Ligon's, you know, this exhibition um, uh, <clears throat> that struck a chord. But I guess one of the most important pieces that I was able to, to experience was um, Adrian Piper's work, uh, the, the uh, video piece. And I just thought it was fantastic, you know, and there was a, there was such a clarity to it and an understanding. But I thought it was really, I mean, I, for, for me, her work as an artist, as, a, as an intellectual, as a, as a thinker, um, as a philosopher, is so powerful because what she does precisely is, is to break down space. You know, and she talks about the relationship. She speaks about the wider context of the community mm -hmm. and how you mm -hmm. relate not necessarily to the specifics of a particular thing, if you like, but to move beyond that. And I think that that's, mm. that, that for me is, it, is such a powerful and empowering um, thing, uh, really. Um, and I guess that that's, for me as an artist is, is where my obsession with time, you know, in many senses is a mathematical equation, as a, you know, as something that's so abstracted that goes ahead of oneself, that it is something that can project forward and project backward. It was wonderful to see um, uh, the actress who is, I've forgotten her name, uh, Michelle, Michelle Nichols. Nichols, yeah, Michelle Nichols, um, you know, that beautiful <laughs> end image of, you know, the, the, the um, satellite or space shuttle, whatever, is go, moving away into the distance because there is something for me that formally in that moment, and I, I, I guess that connects to, for me, it, very strongly with some of the, the textual qualities of Glenn Ligon's work, because it is almost as if it can be broken down into some sort of abstracted mathematical equation, if you like. Mm -hmm. It is the present and the past and the future. So that, that relationship to the now, I'm bored with England as well, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm also, you know, kind of not bored with it in a sense, because I think that, well, you know, how, how do you navigate it? And if I could maybe just mention something, strangely enough, when I was an undergraduate student, um, my the chair of the department at that time, um, you know, he was. We were all as young students being allocated studio spaces, blah blah blah, and he came to see me, Barry uh, um, oh, I forgot, Herbert, that was his name. Um, uh, he said, Chutra, I've, I, we've got the perfect space for you, you know, and I said, okay, great. And he said, I said, he said, do you know this student? I said, I don't know that space. And so he said, I'll take you there. And he took me to a room that was not much 
wider than this table. You know, if you imagine this sort of square space of it, and he said, this is your room. And at that time, if you can imagine, I'd had a studio space to make work, which was approximately three, three quarters, to myself, which is unheard of in this day and age, but approximately the three quarters of the si size of this floor space here. And I just thought to myself, you know what, I'm going to make something that just does not fit in this space. They're going to have to find some other space for me. And that's exactly what I did. And they were forced to find some other space. And I think that, <laughs> I think actually that in thinking about, um, I know you ask lots of questions and perhaps I'm sort of coming to it from a rather roundabout position, but I think that there's something about thinking about the context of where you are, you know, whether it's England or the States or Europe or Australia or Africa, India, wherever it is, or space, there is, there is something that's really interesting about, you know, about the relationship of that. And especially in seeing, Sonia, your, your presentation, because that image of the scientists, the, the Asian scientists, I remember posting that. And I remember you posting that, and I remember so many other people posting it. And in a way, you know, even something as apparently benign as Facebook gives a certain kind of agency to space, which is all about an abstract. And I think that that's really fascinating to me conceptually, but also in terms of how then we extrapolate back from that space into creating something, whether it's piece of text, a piece of prose, a piece of art, a performance, a piece of, you know, a film work. And I think that that's what I think is so interesting about the think tank, you know, that it allows that sense mm -hmm. of, you know, um, intellectual and formal ambition or contextualization or that sense of desire, whatever that might be, whether it's a horse in your living room or whether it's, you know, being on that spaceship with, you know, uh, um, uh, Nichelle Nichols <laughs> traveling somewhere. I think there's something really interesting about that. So it doesn't matter to me whether I'm in England or whether I'm in the state. It's actually where my mind is that's important. Do you want to come in? Yeah, I'll try and remember a few things. Um, the first thing is, if you've watched the Adrian Piper um, video, one of like, the most profound things it said was that art, she made art for the world and not necessarily for the art world. And that's really stuck for me in terms of how I want to see my practice and really my kind of like contextual framework is the here and now and things which are happening within culture and society and I think that's what's so powerful about Glenn Ligon's work that it is not just about reference of the art world but really about what's happening in a socio-political context and to add to that one of like in the ways in that how I make my work and the methodologies as any artist methodologies are very individual they're individualistic you will never really be able to replicate another kind of methodology within the art world it's not like a science and it's one that comes with personal experience so part of my methodologies really is like collecting all of these bits from popular culture so for example one of my last rants was looking at Big Brother, and I never really watched Big Brother. I hate watching Big Brother. However, I watched this recent one. If anyone's watched it, is anyone watching it? No? Okay, good. Okay, so basically, <laughs> there's this the Ghanaian girl called Ajoma or something like that. She was outed, I think, in the first week. She was put up for eviction. And they had these, like, particular... They, caught, they asked the public to make these kinds of assertions about who was the most this, who was the most that. So one of the questions was, who's the, who's the top three best-looking people? Who is the most unfaithful? Who is the most whatever? And Ajoma got picked for about two or three things. And she was like, I don't know why. I don't know why this is happening. I was like, it's because you're black, girl. You're black. So what I'm trying to say, it's not just a question of power, but it's also about perception, because the things which they were tagging on to her so-called personality was really unnecessary because you can't know someone's personality in two days so it becomes a matter of perception and appearance so this is how I get my kind of stimulus for the things I want to make in terms of the racial fascism 
if you go back to the piece I want me some brown sugar that was really interesting because I collected these texts from what the viewers like the watchers had said I didn't edit anything I just left it as it was I looked at all these different categories so from interracial homosexual sex to heterosexual interracial um, uh, couples to lesbian interracial couples and it was very interesting how the different communities of people talked about race so within like the, gay, the homosexual um, categories, it became like the gay men were fetishizing sex. It's like, oh my God, I want this black man to, you know. When it became, when it was around the interracial, heterosexual um, couplings, it became really nasty, like master and slave sort of thing. When it became, when it was around the lesbian interracial categories, I actually think it was just men talking about how wanted to see women. So it was a very different way that they were talking about these things. And I think that kind of, another uh, kind of uh, question around utterance and um, the things that people say was really prevalent to that piece and also to the Glenn Ligon show. So racial fetishism is always there in all these stereotypes. Yeah. Um, in terms of like, based on everything that you guys have said and the talk in general. Um, what are your ideals for the future with um, how gender roles, um, sexuality and race would be? So for example, um, when you're talking about um, breaking down, is it role, role reverse? Role um, reversal. Yeah, role reversals. Yeah. Um, from, from speaking to people in general, um, girls don't generally want to be like guys, guys don't really want to be like girls, but that no one's really content with how they are right now especially um f females so, so sort of what what would your ideals be same thing with race as well people have they see problems within it but a lot of the time i'm not quite sure what the ideal what people want in a sense so but, um sort of to to get a talk because you also you guys have thought about it a lot more than um the average person on the street not necessarily um, it's privileged Sorry? Not necessarily that we think more about it, we're just more privileged. We oh, fair. Forums. So, so what, what, what's your vision of, of how things would be? Or if, if you could make it in, in any way, how would it be? Um, how far in the future are we talking about? <laughs> <laughs> no, this is, this is <laughs> It's not, a, and not, not, not any time frame at all. So basically, if right now, if you could just click your fingers and how things would be right now. So it's not a sense of moving forward or, or backwards or whatever, but how, would, how should things be in a sense? So you can go as far forward as you want. <laughs> I, for, for me, I think that... Um, I think feminism is one of the most dangerous things, actually, as, an, uh, as a kind of ideological construct, because... It's about equality, actually. You know, it's about equality of, of labor, of reward, of, of all of these different things. So for me, I guess that in an ideal world, you know, that's what I would be looking at or hoping for. Um, there are, there's, a, there's a work I had made in 2006, actually with, with Jana, called Remembrance of Things Past that takes its title from um, a, 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 a work by Proust. And um, it's, a, it's a work in which I collaborated with uh, Jana and the Art Gallery of Ontario, but also a very mixed range, uh, a group of um, range of ages, but a very mixed group, um, racially mixed group of, of adolescents. And um, one of the things that really struck me in that, in that work, um, it was the piece of the, with the, the yellow bus in it. And it, I, I, I don't know that we've got time to go into it, to, to, the, um, to the structure of that, that work. It's not really a narrative piece, but there is a kind of narrative subtext if you like but one of the young men that we spoke to and actually he was 13 at the time 13 or 14 was a young uh, uh, black uh, Canadian teenager and we asked all of the kids you know 
what is what is it that the, do you think what is it that the world expects of you and it was very interesting listening to the kids respond actually and this particular young man you know talked about the kind of inequalities if you like and then at the end of it he sort of and I'm I'm summarizing it he said well you know I'm not really into politics you know I I just want to be a dentist I'm into teeth <laughs> and I think that that was for me really poignant because that was what he wanted to be but the circumstances of his living conditions if you like were not necessarily something that were going to completely be behind his aspirations his goal was more than likely going to be achieved because of the context of his his back background in economic terms one that was born out of a particular kind of class struggle so i thought that there was something very interesting about that very point for me so in answer to your question what is it that i'm looking for well i'd like a little bit more poetry in my life really but i'd like also the opportunity to create ways of living that were there were more equitable for everybody where there was more equality and that really is not the case you know we're in a moment of high capitalism right now and i think that that's highly problematic yeah for me i mean i think artists arts questions i don't necessarily think we have the answer to anything and that's one of the reasons why i'm interested in in the think tank as a kind of collective endeavor because the idea is that in you know in september when we have this event um during the primary or in a year's time or in two years time um you know what the institute proposes for the future will be a result of many people um feeding into this process not just kind of me and as, as an individual which i think is really important um but you know if you think about kind of here and now immediately there are um very particular projects that i would like to see um you know beyond the utopian i want equality for everyone which i do when i see things like um black lives matter for example i want the lives of black women to mean as much as black men you know when i think about um the fact that we have food banks in this country yet we're all often our caps to new raw baby it makes me want to be sick no offense to the baby you know but i think that there's something really wrong with the fact that this family don't really work and we give them money and yet there are people in this country who can't afford to feed their kids so all those kind of structural things that that should be mentioned i think are really important you know i don't want any other young nigerian origin girls to look at snow white and put powder on their face I don't want that to happen to anyone again. <laughs> I really don't. Um, you know, I don't want any young women to be forced into marriage. I don't want any young men to feel as if they have to perform a certain form of masculinity that doesn't allow them to be their full selves and to be sensitive and to be kind and to be nice. Um, I want everyone to have the opportunity to be creative, but also, you know, be scientific if they want to be. What I really want to do is to create to help to correct uh, alongside millions of other people a set of circumstances where people have the time and the space to really kind of reclaim their imagination to reclaim their imagination from the forces of kind of neoliberal capitalism right to have time to to think and to do things other than work and toil all the time one of the reasons why I'm interested in this philosopher Franco Berardi is that he asks the question is what if 1974 was different what if rather than the unions fighting for the right to work they fought for more labor time what if their response to the onward march of neoliberal capitalism wasn't we want more time in the factory who likes being in the factory what if it was actually we want a bit more education or actually we want to work four days a week so on the fifth day i can spend time with my kids you know, what if we can reimagine the way in which we live uh <coughs> Oh, if we can reimagine the way we to live, how, how, what would we imagine? What would it be? So I'm interested in, in helping to create spaces for those kinds of dialogues to take place. Um, 
and to just, you know, if I could wake up tomorrow and in a perfect world, it would be a world where everyone had food, there was no war, there was no sexism, um, you know, everyone was equal, and we all just cuddled each other, and like, there were like <laughs> bunnies, and all that kind of hippie stuff I would love to see. But I think materially, I, would, I want more lives, particularly the lives of um, people who are of the world's majority, to actually matter. Um, I don't want another situation where a group of kids have a pool party and some policeman comes along and assaults a 15-year-old girl and somehow it was her fault, yet some religious family can have a son who goes around molesting his sisters and he was just being a young man and that's okay. Do you know what I mean? There were all these kinds of really strange messages being sent out. I want people to produce better sons. I want people to produce more confident daughters. And we can't really do that unless we create a space for us to actually learn who we are and to be ourselves in safety. That was a bit of a political forecast, but... <laughs> like a manifesto. Yeah. It's a good point to end. Um, I think my, my whole practice is about creating these multiple ways of seeing. And I think someone like Griselda Pollock said it because wherever you sit, you either be in the margin or at centre. All of these things are very relational. One time I might be, you know, in the oppressed here, if I go maybe back home to Nigeria, given my background, I'll be in another position. So really what my artwork is about is showing these multiple ways of being and existing. Wow, mm -hmm. powerful statement. Yes. <laughs> um, and it also got me thinking about a quote uh, made by Amelia White. Um, I don't know if I've got this correctly, but she was talking about how you expose whiteness and how whiteness infiltrates institutions. And she's saying a way of exposing whiteness was to make it strange, to make it abstract, to radicalise it so that people can notice these operations of white supremacy within culture. So I try and use that kind of whole thinking with other sorts of modes of oppression. Um, so in terms of thinking about race or gender, if you start seeing it in the abstract and making it really strange that you can notice it. It's a way of trying to change kind of perception. So just really loosely thinking, I don't know if anyone's watching the FIFA Women's World Cup. I think that is a really big start because in the day we're talking about representation. A lot of people don't know about football, women's football, because it's never been on TV. But if you think about a system where from the get-go women's football has been on TV, then we'll have a different perception of what women can do. So really, a lot of my practice also is about trying to get these images into the mainstream. So we can sit here and talk about all of these things within the art context, but actually, where is this work going to make more of the kind of effects? And for me, that's my kind of next project. I'm doing quite a big thing next year, which I won't talk about now, but it's about how you get this artwork to make a difference into, the, you know, into society. So that's my kind of goal, because you know, it's all about representation, it's all about these images. The images that we see, it's all ideology and propaganda, but just to think how as an artist can we infiltrate that so that the work exists also in the mainstream and not just hidden away in the art world. So that's my kind of vision. And that's what I want, really, these multiple ways of seeing and being. Can I ask you a question about the World Cup, though? Um, do you yes. support England or Nigeria? Nigeria! <laughs> Always and forever. That's what I can say. But within my family, my brothers, he supports England. You know, I've got my Nigerian jersey to the day I die. Um, but it's funny, because I think, again, this is about intersectionality, because I appreciate the female um, English team but I don't support the men's one at all. So, I just, you know, it's, it's interesting how these positions change dependent on, you know, what you're seeing and your position. But, yeah, Nigeria. Who do you support? <laughs> I support Arsenal. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 I can say, I can say Liverpool, United. but country-wise, <laughs> country-wise. Country-wise, I don't... I've only ever had bad experiences watching England play in public. Like, there's always some racist that pops up. Mm. So it makes me disinclined to actively support England. Mm. It usually depends, I'll be honest with you, it depends on the composition of the team, right? If the team is looking more like the French team, then I'll support England. Uh, and when you say not, looking, what does that mean in terms of the racial identity? Yeah. yeah. But also, I, I kind of, you know, I do, I do kind of feel English, but in a kind of complex way. But um, it's really hard to support England when the fans are a problem. And I, I've experienced it too many times to, to just do it kind of easily. So Arsenal. 
I just want to share this very quickly. I was there for the Six Weeks World Cup at Wembley for all the games. Mm. My brother's Arsenal, I'm Spurs, right? Sorry. Mm. <laughs> so, so we weren't allowed to put up our cross to St. George's by the fans around us because we weren't English. We were children. Mm. It's extraordinary, isn't it? Mm. Mm. Put that, what's happening now with you, you think it's crazy. And, the, and, and you were in, instructed by the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. The brother said, what, what, what are you talking about? I'm, I'm asking who's Tottenham. Mm. Why can't we put our flag out? It was the English flag. Mm. We weren't allowed to do it. Mm. By the fans around me. Under 100,000, you know. That was what was there. I mean, they probably didn't even know what to do. Apart from the football, they didn't even know what to do. I'm not kidding. Yeah, probably. About the early 60s, yeah. Mm. Um... I think the identity is complex and it shifts, it changes. Um, when I lived in the States, I was very English. I was terribly mm. English, more English than I've ever been in my life. Um, when I'm up here, I feel very much from the East End of London. You know, I think it, it really, I think what I, I mean, I, I don't teach um, young people, but I have a lot of young people in my life, and I, I think that we shouldn't shy away from complexity. I think young people can understand complexity because I think their lives are, are complex in general and, and, and most of them are aware of it. Um, so I think in a way complexity is, is part of the, the question and also the answer to the question. That it's complex and it remains complex. Um, but one of the problems I think for Britain, and, and it's actually no for England, because I think Scotland's in a very different position, a very exciting position. But for England, is that England is, is still kind of in denial about itself and about its history and about the complexity of its history and about the fact that, for example, there have been people of African descent in this country on and off for the last 2,000 years. You know, um, I think if more young people were aware of this, then it will make it um, incrementally less possible for the racists in the pub to be the racists in the pub. I think if more, I think, I think if more people who regard themselves as white and English did DNA tests, it would change everything, right? Um, so I, I don't know, I, I kind of feel that I'm against, you know, in the States, for example, kids do the Pledge of Allegiance and it just horrifies me. I think that this is a very complicated place. I think it has a really great history. I think it has a really terrible history. It has a really complicated history. And what I would like to see taught to young people, which I don't really see happening in terms of the curriculum, is complexity. So actually these things are really difficult to unpick. And it's a role of, it's a job of, it's a lifetime's worth of work to unpick them. But in the meantime, let's find things that we can share and what we have in common. And let's also think about the things that we have that are different in a way that, that, isn't, that doesn't lead to xenophobia. Thank you. 
photograph from one of the teachers, which is called What's Going On, and it's our Muslim TA leaning against a wall with two students. You can take it either way, but she's the teacher, but the picture implicitly looks as if perhaps they're intimidating her, mm. but it's not the case. What's going on? So it's kind of finding more moving visual things that would engage other students in mm. that debate. Can I? I'll just add that I've actually started to do that because, as, as I said, it's one thing making art for the art world, but really, where is it going to change and make a difference? So I actually do some classes at my old primary school, and it's about using semiotics, about how we create images and how we can break them down. So it's like working with stereotypes and all those things and giving students a tool to try and actually unpick these things instead of just taking it. So it is part and parcel of kind of my practice as well. And just to jump in really quickly, there are lots of artists who work with young people and work within education and educational departments and the organisations and institutions. I don't do it myself because I'm not, I'm not so interested in working with young people. Um, I don't mean it in a bad way, but it's just not the way that my energies are directed. But I, I work at Tate part-time as a curator, and there's a whole department of people who work with schools and teachers. Um, and I know that there are lots of artists who make their, kind of their living um, through working with young people. So there are, they do exist. Um, and I think if it was something that anyone was really interested in taking forward very specifically, it's worth getting in touch with the learning department at Tate. It's worth getting in touch with the schools and teachers team because they're bound to have access to artists who live in this area as well as in London. Um, and there are other organisations as well that do it. But there are, there are artists who, who make their living through doing these sorts of well, work I and you engage with it. In the four and a half minutes, I have to compare my lesson along with the other 45,000 students and teachers that are going through this process. It would mm -hmm. be really good. Yeah. Well, I think that the exhibition here is actually a great starting point because one of the things that is so extraordinary about this show is precisely that it elaborates on concepts of beauty. And there is so much beauty within this show, you know, whether it's in a literal sense, you know, the, the lure of uh, Felix Gonzalez Torres's sweets on the floor, you know, in those particular colours. But, you know, on every single level, there is something that's really rich and enticing. And I think that, I think that kids respond to that, actually. And I think that one of the th one of the wonderful things is, you know, how do you find language for that, for that very particular experience? And I think that that, for me, you know, there is something very poetic about that, you know, about that, that moments of, of transformation when you recognize that something very simple, you know, uh, can take you to another place. And I think that, you know, maybe, maybe it's so great to see this exhibition, but this kind of exhibition doesn't happen enough, really. I think that's the problem. <laughs> Well, part of it, anyway. <laughs> can, I just, can I just come in? Um, one of the, the things that um, strikes me is that a, a central point is, is the truth in, in all of this and, and telling of the truth or telling of people's yes. truths in all of this in terms of how that then influences image and influences the power of the image. Um, and I'm wondering, um, how, do you, how do you provoke such a powerful cultural paradigm that we're in? Um, because uh, uh, the truth is so distorted, particularly around black image, black people, black history, black culture, black form. You know, it is so distorted. Um, and taken out of its context and its reality, and therefore its beauty. So at what point do you start to grapple with that in this very powerful cultural paradigm that we have that keeps producing and reproducing a central image that we've all got to sort of pay, pay abeyance to? 
um, you know, it, it, is, it is the single, it is the white male first and foremost. How do you interrupt that, you know, in all of this? Um, and it's not just from, from um, an artistic point of view. It is, as you've, be, as, you've, uh, as you've hinted, the political and the social point of view. Because I think things are, are, are being lost, a lot is being lost, and I don't know whether things can actually be recovered, and that's my concern, particularly for, for young African and Caribbean people who are the, the now post-slavery, the products of that history. How do you then start to recover their truth through the medium of art and image and intersectionality. I mean, it's, you know, I, I think that, you know, the world is a real mess, and I don't know that I believe in what is truth anyway. And um, in as much as I think, you know, what you say is, is, is accurate, well, it, I... I, I I hear what you're saying, and I, um, you know, it's a very complex question and set of issues. I don't know that there is a truth for for black, and I don't know that there is a truth for white. Actually, you know, if you see a lot of those paintings of <laughs> um, allegedly beautiful portraits of, you know. Um, white British or European or North American folk, you know, donning, being very sort of much depicted in a position of power. A lot of that is quite ugly, actually, <laughs> to me. It's, that's not beauty. And I think that, um, I think Nietzsche sort of describes truth as, you know, a mobile army of metaphors. <laughs> um, you know, it's a very complex, Thing. And then you look at what's happened in Syria in no time at all. I don't know how we really unpick any of that because it has a very particular relationship to capital, actually. You know, everything that's happening in the Middle East is absolutely to, related to, you know, constructs of power and money and capital. So... In that sense, I, I sort of feel that, you know, we're all enslaved, really. I don't know, that's just my view. But. OK, a few things. I have this heckler. Now, this heckler, <laughs> and I was just telling Sonia, she comes to all of my shows and all of my talks, and she asks me the same question every time. I don't get your work. Why are you doing it? What is it? The same question every time. And the last time, it was about a few weeks ago, I was having a discussion with a black male photographer called Ajamu. Some people might know his work. And he works around the homoerotic um, black male desire. So the heckler was here. And she asked the same thing. I don't get what you're doing. And I was already prepared for this girl. And the first thing she said to me is, that, I don't see myself in your work. I'm a lesbian. I don't see myself. And I thought to myself, but I'm not making my work for you. This is my truth and really how I see the world. So that question of truth, of course, is subjective. Uh, my work is very personal. It's my starting point is myself. And obviously I try and, you know, touch on the wider um, societal uh, context. But it really comes from myself. So that's the first thing. Um, I don't know if anyone knows the work of Zanani Mahoney. And Zanani Mahoney is the black... A South African uh, photographer who makes, who takes images of black lesbian women in South Africa who have been raped, and so she's an activist first and foremost, rather than a photographer. But her work again is about these truths of these women. And I think one of the ways of you know talking about truth is for people to document it, and that's a really essential part of her practice is that she's creating these archives around true facts around these women who gives these statements. I think it's really important to document these things because that's how you, this is how you create truth. The more and more you have of something, the more it becomes normalized. And that really also got me thinking about, you know, the show that I, the talk I had a few weeks ago and the facts that we had this audio recording, this audio recording of, I think a very pivotal, you know, um, event and it was lost. The guy says to me, oh my God, it got destroyed and that was it. Email, sorry, it was a good talk. 
I was like, but this is unacceptable because these sorts of bits of history now get lost because someone hasn't recorded it. So in terms of thinking about what truth is, I think you just have to document these things. And the more and more it happens, the more it becomes sedimented into society and history. So personally, I want to destabilise the whole notion of truth to begin with. <laughs> I, I want to make it tricky and slippery and, and to kind of challenge challenge our attachment to the concept of something being true. Um, I also think that I, I agree with what um, both my, my friends were saying about um, truth being kind of subjective. So we can all see, you know, the, the story of, you know, 10 people can see a car crash and they all see different things or mm. something of that nature. Um, but in terms of kind of shifting the paradigm and of um, uh, now, how do we challenge um, patriarchy and how do we challenge this kind of neoliberal capitalism and all those kinds of things? I think there are a couple of things that I, I really think is important to bear in mind. Firstly, that actually we have to, um, we have to include a class analysis within this. So, you know, like a white male who is from a working class background or a background where he hasn't worked and maybe his dad hasn't worked, you know, isn't doing well in this society, and the society isn't built around supporting him to reach his full potential any more than it is um, someone from a different background in this country, from a similar class position. And I think one of the things that concerns me about kind of the impact of Blair and that kind of benign neoliberalism that he brought in was that the uh, collective ability in this country to impose a class analysis on issues of structural inequality kind of been lost because people have been encouraged to think about themselves as part of a particular individualistic community group and have community leaders rather than thinking about actually this is a structural thing. You know, these people have everything and the rest of us who have very little. And I think it's a really important analysis. But in terms of the image and the position of black people, I'm actually really optimistic and maybe I'm I don't know, maybe I'm a maybe I'm a dreamer. But I think that we have access to more information about ourselves than we have ever had. Um, we have more agency within the West since, um, well, apart from the kind of brief moments of the all black towns in the United States in the 19th century, than we have since then. Um, and it's about what we do with it and whether we recognize it as such. Um, and part of that work needs to be in kind of not only reclaiming our images, but creating the images we want to see. So I think about artists like Steve McQueen, who's in the show, whose work Bear is in the show, who, you know, his first future, well, first of all, we went to the same art school. So I went to Goldsmiths. It was really tough being a working class black girl at Goldsmiths. And we had these weekly lectures and Steve came in and did one of the lectures. And it was the first time, the only time really, in that institution where I felt someone had seen me because he spoke of his experiences there, which were very similar to my own. And he doesn't, he doesn't give it. A care. He would just speak his mind, and I really appreciated that. Uh, and when he started to make cinema, you know, he made a film about hunger strikers, the IRA hunger strikers. You now he has the freedom to do that, and to make a film about a, a ginger sex addict, and to make a film about enslavement. Um, and I'm interested in the way he's kind of claimed that space from himself. Meanwhile, also making gallery-based exhibitions. Um, there's also a film um, coming out, or just come out now, called The Second Coming which is directed and I believe written by Debbie Tucker Green, who's a, um, a black British playwright. Um, it stars Idris Elba and it's about this kind of middle class black family. The mum is pregnant as she thinks she's giving birth to the second coming of Christ. And I'm really keen to see this film. I'm going to see it this weekend. And one of the reasons I'm keen to see it is because it, is, it comes from this playwright whose who's practice I've followed for a while. And it's about a black family, but it's not about a black family. Like, it's not about a black family experiencing racism. It's about a family of black people. Um, and so what we see increasingly is just us reclaiming these tools to, to um, tell, our, tell stories about ourselves. And I'm really excited about that. Or if you see these kind of young people who set up their YouTube channels and all their kind of digital media enterprises or, you know, their grime radio or record label, I don't know all this young people stuff, but you know, you see them doing it. And um, so I think there's a, lot of up, there's a lot of good things happening, but what doesn't happen necessarily is that it doesn't get foregrounded. And I think it only gets foregrounded firstly if we foreground it ourselves, if we recognize it ourselves, and if we encourage it ourselves. I remember as a youngster, my mum used to buy the Voice newspaper, 
I remember reading about this young boy called um, Lewis who was really into go-karting and his dad would, had put mm. out a, a plea in the voice for people to support his son financially so he can go to the next level of his go-karting career. Um, and talked about his dad working like two jobs and all this kind of stuff. I remember this as a child reading this and that Lewis was Lewis Hamilton. You know, so I, I think that there are ways in which we do and can support each other that, again, don't get foregrounded because the story of Richard ha of Lewis Hamilton now is about you know him being discovered by Williams and what have you. But but I've read stuff that he's you know interviews that he's given, his father has given, when he talks about this early stage of his life where he was supported by the community. It do, you know it does happen. It is part of his narrative. Um, so that's what I think. I think that it's. And I'm kind of excited by the fact that there are black Tory MPs, that even though I'm not a Tory, I like the fact that they exist because it kind of gives a sense of the way in which we can no longer be categorised, that we live in this neighbourhood, that we vote that way, that we eat this kind of food. I'm really intrigued by this shift, even though I violently disagree with their politics. Um, and I think for me, paradoxically, and there's not a thing I ever imagined saying, something like seeing a black Tory MP is, is exciting to me in a way that seeing these young kids who run these YouTube empires is as well. What Something about, has really uh, shifted. What about seeing a black UKIP? Th that I don't understand. <laughs> 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 I don't understand. Each their own. Yeah, so...